Okay, well, we may have a few more folks uh, pop in and join us, uh, but seems like a good time to get started. So first of all, I just wanted to uh, welcome you all today to this Coastal Islands and Bird Conservation Panel discussion. Um, a big thank you to the East Coast Credit Union for um, sponsoring us to put on our Connecting with Nature series this year, though via Zoom and on a webinar series. Um, but it's really great to get to connect with uh, folks who are in the conservation community and interested in learning more. So thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Ryan McLean. I'm the volunteer coordinator with the Nature Trust. I wear many hats though, um, and one of which is that I am the webinar wizard. <laughs> um, so uh, I will be kind of just walking you through um, some of the features we'll be using today. So we are going to be going through uh, a few different presentations. Um, we have uh, five or four panelists speaking today. Um, so just one moment, I will switch the slide here. So um, our speakers today will start off uh, with Jessica Bradford, who's a concept conservation project coordinator with the Nature Trust, who her work really focuses around coastal island conservation in Southwest Nova Scotia. Um, so she's gonna give kind of a broad overview of coastal island work being done in this area and kind of focusing a bit on some of the Nature Trust projects. Then we're gonna hear from uh, Riel Hoig, who is a master's student at Acadia University. She's focusing on leeches storm petrel research on Bon Portage Island. Then we'll hear from Nick Knutson, uh, who works with MTRI, uh, but he'll be talking about his master's research on breeding tern uh, populations on islands in Southwest Nova Scotia. And finally, we'll hear from John Kearney, who's gonna kind of take things from that you know, um, species specific information, we're gonna go back out to kind of looking at migratory birds um, and how important coastal islands are for migratory songbirds. Um, so we'll be saving all questions um, for the end. Um, so please feel free to use the Q&A feature uh, located on your bar at the bottom of your screen um, to ask questions. I will be keeping track of this throughout and we'll do our best to answer all the, co all the questions at the end of the presentations. Um, so we're going to get started. I do just want to quickly point out um, that we are kind of very research and nonprofit focused today. Um, we are missing a couple of voices from the table, um, which include uh, government and Indigenous partners. Um, so just just a point that, you know, though we're going to try to give a fairly comprehensive um, look at things, we are missing uh, some perspectives. So we are going to get started with Jessica Bradford. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. And thanks to everyone who could join us today. Uh, so as Ryan mentioned, I'm conservation project coordinator with the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. And one of my project fo focus areas is on coastal island conservation in Southwest Nova Scotia uh, or Gaspoic. And so um, Gaspoic is a Mi'kmaq name for the region, which means land end. Uh, so that's the, the area that I'm going to be focusing on today. Next slide. So first a little bit about why coastal island conservation. Why is this a focus for the Nature Trust? And so really it is um, a bit of a neat hybrid between two of our other um, focal areas or kind of conservation themes um, that we work with. And that would be our Coastal Treasures program. Um, and then also habitat for birds. So it's kind of this uh, coastal islands are this neat intersection between these two uh, focal areas. And so they're isolated and fragile ecosystems and they're threatened by a variety of pressures like invasive species and, um, and development as well. Um, but coastal islands provide refuge for breeding seabirds, migratory birds, overwintering habitat for birds. Um, and given that there's, so, there's been such steep declines in bird species all over the world, um, you know, for example, the state of North America's birds um, report estimated that about 30% of birds have disappeared from North America since 1970. So protecting important bird habitat really is, um, is part of the, the puzzle here to try and, um, try and reverse these declines. Um, and, and many coastal islands in Nova Scotia are privately owned. So this is very similar to our coastal mainland as well, that it is the majority of, um, of sites are under private ownership. And so for Southwest Nova Scotia, actually 96% of coastal islands are privately owned. 
and only about 6% have been formally protected under some form of um, legal protection. And so this is a, a stat um, from 2018. So that might have um, been, been um, changed slightly, but, but, but not drastically. It would still be um, pretty similar. So over the past 25 years, the Nature Trust has conserved around 50 coastal island properties across the whole province, amounting to over 3,000 acres of island habitat protected. And really, the organization's history is actually rooted in coastal island conservation. So the very first conservation lands that the Nature Trust protected uh, were a pair of coastal islands um, in the inner bay of Fundy near Parisboro called the, the Brothers Islands. And so that's not to be confused with the Brothers Islands off of um, Pubnico uh, that I think uh, Nick will chat about a little bit, um, but a different pair of Brothers Islands. And so this was made possible by a donation back in 1995 um, from a conservation-minded landowner named Jack Kerbin. Um, so just a little context uh, around the Nature Trust work um, for coastal islands in the province that goes back to 1995 and people may also recognize the name 100 wild islands uh, so this was a legacy campaign to protect a remote stretch of coastal island wilderness along the eastern shore uh, and it really was a flagship conservation campaign for the nature trust uh, and a major milestone that helped put the organization on the map um, but more recently we've been uh, focusing on islands in um, the southwestern portion of the province. And so uh, a map here shows um, a bit of a kind of regional context of, of the area that we've been working in more recently. Um, so we, we really started working here in about 2012 and I'll, I'll kind of get into the first island that was protected in this, this region uh, by the Nature Trust. Uh, but first I wanted to chat a little bit about what makes this particular area unique and important for conservation. Um, so part of that is um, this, this area is really where the Bay of Fundy and its dramatic tidal range meets the open Atlantic Ocean. And so this creates um, some unique conditions like persistent upwellings, warmer average yearly temperatures, and really high productivity in the outer bay. Um, and that's, that's really a driver for what makes this area important to many nesting seabirds, those really rich um, feeding grounds nearby for them. Uh, but also to a pretty strategic location along the Atlantic Flyway migration route. Um, so it's a, a spot where birds can rest and replenish before or after crossing the Gulf of Maine as well. So the Nature Trust has now protected over a thousand acres of coastal island habitat in this region. So I'll go through a couple of those, um, those islands that we've um, been a part of conserving. Uh, on a little virtual tour and not in the order that um, they're my favorites or anything like that, but in chronicle or chronological order um, of when they were protected. For the first, so the first one is Bon Portage Island. Uh, so this is protected through a conservation easement in 2012 with Acadia University. And I'm not gonna speak too much about uh, Bon Portage because I don't wanna steal Riel's thunder. Uh, that's where she focuses her work. Um, so she'll, she'll be able to speak more to the island. Uh, but I, I did want to say that this um, conservation easement with Acadia was a milestone in land conservation. So it was the first university owned land to be protected through such an agree agreement. And so the 300 acre island, it remains in Acadia's ownership as an outdoor classroom and a research facility, uh, but ensures that conservation values are protected um, through a legal agreement going into the future. And then. So the next uh, would be the Bald Islands. So these are part of the, the Tuskett uh, Islands group. And so it was actually Nova Scotia Bird Society had acquired and, and were managing four islands in the Tuskets um, since the 70s. And so that would be Outer Bald, Middle Bald, Little Half Bald, and Mossy Bald Islands. And so the Nova Scotia Bird Society had donated um, the Bald Islands to the Nature Trust in 2015, among a number of other properties that were kind of under their management at the, at the time. Uh, and so uh, these islands have been watched over by, like many of the islands actually in this area, have been watched over by um, local, like really in, engaged and knowledgeable folks uh, like Ted Dion and Alex Montremont, who I think will get a couple other um, shout outs throughout the course of this presentation. Uh, and they've made many observations on islands like the Bald Islands. For example, um, there's been observations of many nesting birds on the Bald Islands, storm petrel, bank swallows, uh, black guillemot, 
terns, common eider, uh, double crested cormorant, uh, among uh, many more. And so one of the bald islands, outer bald island, actually has a pretty quirky, interesting history as well. And um, it was actually once the principal principality of outer Baldonia. And I, I won't get into kind of the history of that. Um, but Outer Bald Island was actually once a micro nation. And we have a neat blog post that, that gives an overview of that. If anyone is interested, then we can share that link. Um, but of course, uh, one thing to mention about these islands, it's not only the ecological significance, but there's, there's so much history and, and cultural significance um, there as well. Next island, so Seal Island. Um, so there's a, on the Mi'kmaq place names map, there's, um, there's a name for Seal Island, which means far off island. And so it's located 32 kilometers off the coast of Nova Scotia. And it is one of our province's largest and most remote coastal islands. Not the largest and most remote, I think um, Sable Island would, would take the cake on that one, but um, it is one of them. And so the island um, is quite large and it has a rich diversity of habitat there. So salt marshes, bogs, bearishwell ponds, forests, rocky shorelines, dunes and sandy beaches. And so this diversity of habitat is really important to support a diversity of birds as well. And so uh, the Nature Trust recently acquired uh, 650 acres, about 80% of the island. Uh, and this has made, uh, this is a pretty rare opportunity for the Nature Trust to be able to protect um, such a large and offshore island. And this is made possible by uh, Canada Nature Fund and the Nova Scotia Crown Share Land Legacy Trust, um, in addition to the support of many individuals as well. And so it is a birding hotspot. If you look on um, eBird map, it's a, you know, a dark red spot. There's um, there's a lot of diversity that's been recorded there and um, over 330 bird species. And just um, touching on some of the unique cultural value, values as well. There's a seasonal community that um, they still use and visit the island, um, but also just a, a rich history of, of shipwrecks and the light keepers and um, yeah, just a really, really fascinating um, history on the island as well. And we've been working on stewardship planning with the seasonal community members, which is ongoing. And so next we have Pisa's Island. Uh, so this um, is one of our more recent, um, more recently protected islands. So it's a 28 acre property. Uh, we just protected it in early 2020. So similar to seal, it has a diversity of maybe not to the extent of seal, but a diversity of habitat, coastal barren, beaches, salt marshes, and lagoons. Uh, the island, we didn't protect the entire island, we protected a private parcel that was on there, uh, but there's also two um, government owned parcels, so federal and provincial parcels of land. So this really gives a, a, a neat opportunity to partner with government on bird conservation here as well. Um, so, uh, the, the, one of the unique features of Pisa's Island is that um, endangered roseate tern have nested on the island, not in great numbers like they, they would on other islands like the, the Brothers. Um, so it's not an absolute critical site for them, but um, seeing as their numbers have dropped over half in the last decade, there's only about 70 pairs still surviving in Canada. Um, who are found in Nova Scotia and 75% are found within the lobster bay in Tuscan area. So um, every nesting pair um, makes a huge difference for the species long-term survival and it, it could be a site in the future that becomes more important for them. And I, I hope Alex is okay with me sharing his quote. I think he's he's one of the attendees here today, but just wanted to kind of create that you know, a personal connection to the island. Um, so there's a quote there from, from Alex about um, the island as well that I wanted to share. And so we'll get to the next slide. Yeah, so I just wanted to end on speaking about collaboration and stewardship. Um, and the, you know, this really is a huge part of why we wanted to host um, a panel today because collaboration and partnership is so important for um, coastal islands. They're remote, we don't know a lot about them, they're hard to get to, and so it really needs to be a collaborative effort. So there's continued work going on through um, Eskwood Conservation Collaborative on coastal islands. 
and including a prioritization uh, for future islands um, for conservation. Another point is that legal protection of the islands is only the beginning. There's many long-term stewardship considerations, um, you know, a need for monitoring, addressing marine garbage issues, non-native invasive and problematic species. There's just an array of um, considerations that need to be looked at to ensure that um, we're protecting the conservation values of the islands. Uh, we really rely on, on property guardians and volunteers, and I'm sure Ryan could attest to this um, as our volunteer coordinator, um, to be our, our eyes and ears on the ground um, and, and supporting our stewardship efforts. And my attempt at a coastal islands humor is that the nature test is not an island and um, partnership really is key and we really value our, um, all of our partners in this. So thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Jess. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, hear from Riel Hoig from Acadia University about her research. Hi, I'm Riel. Um, I'm a master's student at Acadia University. I'm supervi uh, supervised by Dave Shuttler and Ingrid Fallet, who I think are attending today. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, I study predation of Lisa storm petrels on Bon Portage Island and another uh, coastal island in Nova Scotia, Country Island. Um, I also do a variety of collaborative work around the Lucia storm petrels on BC and other islands in Nova Scotia. Um, can you get the next slide, please? Coming up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just to talk a little bit about the petrels, because you may not have seen them before. They're not too common on mainland Nova Scotia. Um, they're a small, widely distributed seabird species. They're all over the world. Um, they were recently uplisted from near threatened to vulnerable uh, due to a 30% population decline over the past three generations, so that's about 20 to 30 years. Um, we don't know exactly why they're in decline, but it's likely due to a number of causes, um, including plastic ingestion or entanglement, uh, contaminant ingestion, such as mercury or, or pesticides, um, climate change, which can cause changes in food availability, and likely some habitat loss. Um, light attraction can draw petrels and especially juveniles inland or taking them off course, or they can be drawn into oil rigs or ships at sea. And finally, and I'll touch a little more on this on a later slide, uh, predation by introduced and sometimes native species. So the petrels, they're, they're really cool birds. They, they begin breeding around six or seven years of age. And before that, they're out prospecting a bit. Um, we had a good discussion yesterday when we were practicing this presentation about uh, prospecting birds, which I'm sure we'll touch on a bit more later. Um, but these guys can live to be up to 40 years old. So that's kind of crazy. Um, they move to and from their colonies at night, and this is to avoid predators, and they do this uh, to tend to their one egg and chick that they have every year. Um, they return to the same burrow each year, and if they do move, it's usually only a few meters. So as you can imagine, this makes them pretty easy to capture and recapture. All we have to do is reach into a hole and get them to bite us and pull them out. Um, so it makes them a really excellent species for long-term monitoring. And this is where BP is a very special place um, because it's home to about 40,000 breeding pairs. So it's a large colony in Nova Scotia and there's lots of uh, lots for us to sample. Um, next slide, please. So um, as a petrol researcher, I'm part of a larger collaborative group and I'm going to forget some groups here. So forgive me if you're part of any of them. <laughs> Um, but it consists of Birds Canada, the Canadian Wildlife Service, Acadia, Dalhousie, um, UNB, <coughs> excuse me, Memorial, Bowdoin College, and a few more. Um, all of these different groups are conducting their own projects. And sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Riel, can I just interrupt you for one sec? Can I just ask you to their own project? Can I just ask you to speak a little closer to your mic if you can? I think there's a few Speaking people the having. Microphone? There you go. Thank you. Oh, sure. Can you, can you hear better now? Sorry about that. Yes, that's great. Okay, so, um, oh, my internet connection. Okay, all right. It says my internet connection is unstable, so I'm sorry if I blip out a bit. Um, so just, yeah, let me know. So, uh, yes, all those groups that I just mentioned, we all are working on our own projects, um, but because we all work on different islands, we can't all be on all of these islands to sample all these places, so we all just take on little parts of each other's projects. Um, so on BP, we do long-term monitoring of the survival of adults, and we also monitor uh, reproductive success. So we look at hatching um, and whether the bird, the chicks leave the nest or not. 
Um, we also put out tags on the petrels. So uh, we put out both GPS, which are short-term monitoring tags, and GLS tags. So on the top right-hand photo, you can see a 3D printed leg band, which is a geolocator tag. And that stays on the bird for a year and allows us to look at their overwinter movement. And these guys go crazy far distances. They can travel as far as uh, South Africa, uh, just for starters. <laughs> Um, and on the bottom right, there's a picture of a GPS tag, and that is sutured on the bird. It only stays on for one to three weeks, depending on how fast we can catch them again. Um, and that lets us look at their foraging movement. So when they're going out to eat, and where they're going, and how long they, get, they stay there. Um, we also monitor mercury in their diet and tissue. So you can see a photo of me bleeding a bird right there. Um, we monitor their diet for plastics and the general contents, like what kind of fish are they eating. Um, and recently there's a project looking at stress proteins in the blood. I might actually be going out in the next couple weeks to help the students that are looking at that. And I'm looking at predation, so I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, which I am now ready for. <laughs> All right, so here's some photos <laughs> of uh, remains of predation events. Um, the top left-hand one is a bunch of owl pellets. Uh, the top right is um, a gull pellet, so a gull ate a petrol hole and eased it up. <laughs> and I'll get to the other photos in a minute. So my main question with my thesis is how many petrels are being eaten at breeding colonies? Um, so in 2018 and 2019 on BP, I walked uh, transects around the island and I determined from the remains of predation events that I found um, that about 5% of 4,000 individuals are eaten by gulls and owls on BP every year. Um, on another seabird colony island, Country Island, uh, similarly, the staff there walked transects uh, weekly or bi-weekly, and the petrol predation there is near zero, but part of that is that um, out there the staff practice predator management, so they don't have gulls and owls nesting on the island. Um, in 2019, I added another study of meadow vole diet. Um, there's a really cute picture of me holding one in the bottom there. Um, they are supposed to be largely herbivorous, but on Country Island that I mentioned earlier, they have super high densities of voles. Um, it seems they only appeared in the last few years. Um, and we keep finding eggs outside of burrows and they found um, some seabird chicks out there with wounds on their legs and on their bodies that we think are due to voles. So to try and figure out are voles depredating nests, um, I did some stable isotope analysis on their fur and feces. And as with many <laughs> scientific questions, the answer to are they eating these eggs and chicks is maybe, but we're not sure. Um, just based on the higher density of voles on country and the stable isotope results, it looks like they could be eating petrels on country and it's more likely that it's happening there, but it could also be happening on BP as well. Um, so the take home from all of this is that predation can be a significant cause of mortality, but it's highly colony dependent. And of course, more colonies need to be monitored and it doesn't account for what goes on at sea. Um, yeah, so that's all of the work that I participate in on bomb portage. And if anybody has any questions for me, please leave them in the, the Q&A box. Awesome, thanks, Riel. Uh, now we're gonna hear from Nick Knudsen, uh, who's gonna talk about his master's research. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So, um, yeah, I'm currently working at MTRI as, uh, as the volunteer coordinator as well, so I work a lot with Ryan. Um, and I'm finishing my uh, master's research on uh, studying terns in Lobster Bay, which was a very collaborative project. So I thought uh, I was really excited to get to come and talk to you guys about this. Um, it was fun, uh, not only the research angle, but it's also where I really got my appreciation for the role that uh, stewards and volunteers could play in conservation. So I thought it was a really nice subject to get to talk about. Um, so just touching quickly on the conservation. So I worked with a lot of people. So universities, I was with uh, Dr. Mark Mallory at Acadia University and Sean Craig, University of Santa Ana. A lot of help from both federal and provincial governments, uh, really crucial help from local stewards that I'm gonna talk about. And then a lot of uh, other help from people like Ben Morton, a fisherman who helped us get out to islands as well. And lots of people that I have also forgotten, but I'm very sorry about that. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so the 
So I started studying uh, tern nesting, but in particular, I was focused on the roseate tern. They're a federally and provincially endangered species. And uh, I studied one of the kind of key parts of their conservation, as is the case for lots of other species as well, their uh, nesting habitat. And I was uh, financially supported by a number of groups here. A little press for time, I won't go over it, but uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so that's kind of my like joke, and we were saying earlier, it's really hard to know if your joke lands on a Zoom call because everyone's muted. But roseate tern nesting is also very collaborative, as well as studying them. Um, in Canada, roseate terns only nest within a colony of common and or arctic terns, but I don't think they've been found nesting just with arctic terns, but they only nest with a colony of other terns. Um, and you can see in these three pictures here, they're very uh, similar looking birds, which was very intimidating as a fresh master student, but uh, again speaks to how appreciative I was of all the uh, collaboration that I had, and all the help. Next slide. Um, so kind of just giving a story, a story version of the work that I did. So I started studying roseate terns in 2017 on North Brother Island. You can see here just kind of a little uh, dot. It's in the area that Jessica was talking about earlier. Um, in southwest Nova Scotia. And here's a picture from on a boat right nearby. So you can see it's a very small, rocky island, very low elevation. Um, next slide. But North Brother and South Brother, even though it was not in that image, um, they're very special. They are, a, it's a federally protected critical habitat for roseate terns. So just kind of trying to give a little shout out to the federal government or the governments in general, because it was a very collaborative a process to have that done. You can see in the picture here uh, to the left that there's only a few of these places in uh, Nova Scotia but also in Canada. Almost all of the roseate terns that nest in Canada are in Nova Scotia. So the brothers in southwest, Country Island which uh, Riel mentioned, and then Sable Island which is the biggest but it's a little bit of an outlier. Um, so my experience started uh, by getting on this boat that we see here, the Royal Sea 23. It's Ted Dayon's boat, um, uses it, anchors near the uh, islands we're trying to get to, then we throw that zodiac into the water and we zodiac into shore. Um, he's a retired pharmacist who's been really an incredible steward. He's been studying uh, turns in Lobster Bay for more than 25 years. And if you wanna kind of get a quick overview of all the work that he's done, his website is very simple, teddayon.com. Um, and there's a picture here of him uh, actively helping the roseate terns on North Brother. And so he's working on some nest shelters. Um, it's something he's been doing for a long time. And they, roseate terns like nesting in areas with cover. And so if you offer them nest shelters, like Ted is doing here, um, it not only can potentially help their productivity, but it also makes them easier to study. Because if they're in a big colony of hundreds and hundreds of nests, it's a lot easier to find the roseate nests if you know that they're probably in these nest boxes. Um, so there was a question um, from Mel, I think, in the comments already just about if increases in predators has had an influence on shorebirds. Um, and in fact, in the first year that I was there studying terns, really enjoying myself, we had a devastating uh, amount of predation thanks to gulls and also crows and we can see here an image from a trail cam we we had eggs that were disappearing from our nest so we set up trail cams and we were pretty sure that birds weren't going to be able to reach inside of the nest boxes to get eggs but then we got images like this of a gull clearly being able to do it and i won't get into the gory details of what else happened but needless to say there was abandonment of north brother on that year so the colony left we got there one day on the Royal Sea 23, no turns to be found, um, which was upsetting. But then thanks to Alex Tantremont, who was already mentioned as well, and who we'll talk about again in a little bit, um, we found them again. Some of the same birds uh, nesting about eight kilometers west on Gull Island, so another coastal island uh, in Lobster Bay. So this is an overhead picture of Gull Island. Um, it's kind of a tear-shaped island along a thin rocky spit kind of going up north and in the southwest edge there's kind of a darker area and that's a big pond and so 
the terns that Alex found on Go Island 2017 were nesting there and they actually have some success. There's an image, um, I should have added a um, recognition there, but I think that's an image from Alex um, of a successful roseate chick that he observed on 2017 on, in 2017 on Go Island. Which then led to uh, one of the first parts of my MSc that I'm working on. So I'm studying the nest sites of common Arctic and roseate terns on Gull Island. And um, so first we compared nest sites to random sites. And in this slide on the left, there's kind of a classic. So I said on uh, North Brother, we were offering them nest boxes. But if there are no nest boxes, this is the type of natural habitat that we found the roseate terns were nesting in. So a lot of kind of cover offered uh, kind of sideways by the rocks, but also even some overhead cover. So they really found these little crevices where they could put their nests. Um, and then obviously because the goal is not just to find pretty nest sites for them, but it's to know where they're going to have the most productivity because we want them to uh, grow in population numbers. We also compared successful and unsuccessful nests. I'm not really getting into any results in this, so if you have any questions, or feel free to uh, contact me after or add a question. Um, yeah, and so finally, uh, so that's kind of the first part of my master's. And then the second part is I'm comparing island characteristics between islands that were used and not by terns in Lobster Bay. So we can see here, this is only a small part of the data set. In total, we have 97 islands that we um, are looking at. And just again, it gives me a chance to, again, give a lot of recognition to Alex Donsermo. It's a data set that he's been working on. Uh, we see his kind of setup here with his zodiac that he uses to zoom around to all these islands and uh, collected uh, data on whether or not the islands were used or not by terns. And so a lot of the islands that we've already mentioned, uh, Gull Island is the kind of secluded one we see in yellow there, but also it's just cut off here. But if we could see it, Bon Partage was actually also used by terns. So it was also included in this study as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. Very interesting stuff. Um, now we're going to hear from John Kearney about bird migration on coastal islands. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, being here this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about bird migration, but primarily looking at songbirds, what we call passerines, rather than uh, seabirds and uh, shorebirds. Um, of course, these passerines, um, uh, the majority of them that nest in Nova Scotia are um, uh, neotropical migrants. They, they spend the winter in Mexico, Central America, South America, as far south as, uh, as Argentina, Peru. <clears throat> and they come back to Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia every spring to nest. Of course, they also spring as um, breed as far north as the um, as the uh, to the limit of the northern boreal forest in many cases. So they make this spring migration and fall migration. And when you look at the spring um, migration, the birds are much more of a in a hurry than they are in the autumn to get to Nova Scotia because they. Um, uh, they they only have a limited time to nest when the when the when the conditions are just right for the, when the insects emerge and they're able to feed their young. So um, this means that when they're coming here in the in the spring, they sometimes run into bad weather. You can know what the weather can be like in Nova Scotia in the spring. You can get long strings of bad weather, and they're sort of piling up, waiting to cross. The, the Bay of Fundy or the Gulf of Maine. And at times, as, as you get into late May, they may have to make a flight that is probably more hazardous than what they would like to take. Um, and here you see on Machaya Seal Island, which is on the other side of the Bay of Fundy from us, this was a spring, uh, this is around 2010, I would say. Um, and we saw this, this same kind of thing happen in parts of Nova Scotia, where the birds took off to cross the Gulf of Maine and they hit some kind of bad weather and they had to make uh, emergency landing on Machaya Seal Island. And you can see there's, this is just two shots out of many shots and they're all the same 
told, you know, thousands of birds um, seeking shelter on Machaya Seal Island. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the the um, so the important thing in looking at um, coastal islands, and when I talk, for me, coastal habitat of migratory birds includes peninsulas, headlands, as well as the islands, because they're part of a of a whole that birds follow in their in their migration pathway. But <clears throat> on this this map here on the on the right is for the autumn, and you can see that. Um, Birds that are coming south from Labrador, Quebec, Newfoundland, um, Prince Edward Island, they're traveling in a broad front um, across Nova Scotia to the southwest. And they begin to pile up on the coast of, in the southwest coast of Nova Scotia. And when they get there, they have to make a choice. They have to decide if they're gonna take a long trip across the Gulf of Maine or take a shorter trip across the Bay of Fundy. The, du the direct trip um, in, is a, a long distance flight. It has a high fuel cost. It is very risky because of the changes in weather conditions that can take place, but there is less risk of predation. However, if they detour via the Bay of Fundy, they are um, to get to the same place in, in Southern Massachusetts, um, they have to take multiple short flights, but with lower fuel costs because they can refuel along the way. It's less risky in terms of weather, but, it, but there is a higher risk of predation because they're more exposed to predators. And so radar studies and acoustic studies um, in Nova Scotia have shown that uh, actually a very significant portion of birds do um, cross the Bay of Fundy rather than cross the Gulf of Maine. But we don't know um, what, that, the, what, that, what that proportion is exactly. Even the black pole warbler, which nests in the boreal forest um, and heads um, in the, even for the western boreal forest and comes east um, to Nova Scotia in, in the fall, they migrate directly from Nova Scotia um, to um, places like um, Puerto Rico and, and the Dominican Republic, um, directly over the water in a single flight. But even in this case, they will make a decision when they get to Nova Scotia, whether they're gonna cross the Bay of Fundy first and leave from Massachusetts, or if they're gonna leave from Nova Scotia. So um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So coastal islands play um, two cru crucial roles in bird migration. First, they are the last stop for refueling before crossing a water barrier. So the quality of the habitat and the existence of habitat where they can refuel is uh, very important because they're about to make a very long flight. Even the Bay of Fundy is not a piece of cake. Uh, so uh, th this is uh, one uh, very important dimension that we need to make sure that we maintain the stopover staging areas and the kind of habitat they need to do this refueling. And second, the role that islands and coastal headlands play is that is it as is for emergency landings. Um, weather conditions can change very fast. Birds can either be coming fr coming from the south. And, and running into bad weather or they're leaving here and they get out of the water and they find that they've uh, come across stronger winds or rain or thunderstorms or whatever, and they have to come down as quickly as possible. And um, you can see here uh, a picture of a scallop dragger. Uh, I believe this was last fall out in the middle of the Bay of Fundy. And um, on one evening, um, all of a sudden, 300 common yellow throats landed on this scallop. But we don't know exactly what the conditions were that brought those birds down. But this is evidence of how birds will at times 
and we don't know how often, but this seems to happen fairly regularly. They need uh, landing areas. And just to illustrate how crucial there is, a recent study was done in the Gulf of Mexico that showed that <clears throat> in the Gulf of Mexico, um, young tiger sharks, um, they did a study of people were studying tiger sharks and they were analyzing what food they were eating and they found that 30% of the food in their stomachs were migratory passerine birds. Um, so that shows you, gives you some idea of um, how dangerous a trip it is for birds to cross over water. So um, we really have very little information on the use of these coastal islands and um, headlands by birds, with the exception of places like Sable Island, Seal Island, Bon Portage Island, or Cape Sable Island, which is heavily birded. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So how do we gather the data that we might need to determine this importance for migratory birds? Well, radar is one, um, and the one that my work is focusing on is bioacoustics. Um, bioacoustics is listening for birds. In the case of migratory birds, you're listening for their flight calls. They make a very um, uh, short calls, barely um, at times perceptible. They're just little seats, uh, sips, uh, little, little, little chips, uh, high-pitched chips, and um, these can be detected um, um, when they're flying overhead and off, often when they're on land because um, they, they can tend to make these uh, flight calls when they're getting all excited about leaving or having just arrived. Instead of their sort of normal songs or their normal chips, they use these uh, migratory um, flight calls to sort of rally the troops and to communicate with each other. They seem to be able better able with these, what appear very indistinct um, chips or seats um, to understand uh, each other, like who they are, like they, there's evidence that they can, uh, that they know each bird individually or what sex they are just by the, the sound of this little flight call. So scientists have used, uh, most scientists have used um, the song meter, uh, this equipment on the far left here to um, their very high quality equipment that have been around for a number of years to study breeding birds and migratory birds, but they're, they're quite expensive. They're you know, around $900 US and when you take into exchange currency and uh, duties, uh, HST, you're talking about $1,500 or more per unit. So that makes it very expensive. You want to put them on a whole lot of islands and get a real large picture of, um, of bird migration. On the, at the other extreme, on the far right, is the audio moth. This is a, 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 a technology that has only existed for the last couple of years, uh, three years, I, I guess. And uh, it's very small. Um, here it is in my hand. You can see you can fit it into the palm of your hand. And it, but it, and it runs just on three AA batteries, but uh, you can use it running almost full time for two weeks or, or for sampling rates at different times of the day or night. You could, it will last for a month that you don't have to check it. So in our listening together project, we're using this audio moth to give to, um, other scientists, but especially citizen scientists and uh, uh, First Nations communities, Mi'kmaq communities, to deploy these um, audio moths in the field for various types of biodiversity projects. Next slide, please. So the, 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 the problem is, is that when you have, if you're gonna have 25 audio moths out in the field collecting data all night about these birds, somebody's gotta go and listening to all those recordings. And that's a lot of work. So the, the, the second part of this is, is advances that are being made, not only in the technology, but in the processing of data. So um, this uses 
um, artificial intelligence. And I've listed here a couple of the, of the bioacoustics websites using artificial intelligence. And one that's the easy for any of you to use if you have a recording is BirdNet, which is run out of uh, Cornell University. And you, if you take a recording of a bird on your cell phone and you, you drop that recording into uh, a, a box on the BirdNet site, it will attempt to tell you um, the birds that you have, have heard. And it's actually quite good. Um, the problem is that it will tell you that if you're in a hemlock stand that you uh, had a black throated green warbler and that's great. But it, it might also tell you had a Townsend's warbler, which is a West Coast bird. So um, there, there's still a long ways to come with this, but we're, the important thing is that we're making progress. And even with some of the more traditional software that's, that I've listed here at the bottom, um, it will nevertheless speed up the process, uh, automatically pull out all of the bird calls in your recordings for you, which that we can do now quite easily. And that's a huge first step to at least pull all the bird calls right out of the recording. Next slide. So um, the Listening Together project, which is funded by the Canadian Nova Scotia governments is um, currently doing a number of biodiversity projects of which one of them is studying the autumn migration of the Canada warbler with audio moths um, and volunteers from the Nova Scotia Bird Society and Acadia First Nation are participating in this study. In the case of the Canada warbler, it appears that the Bay of Fundy and the Gulf of Maine is the only large body, only large water body that this species, species crosses on its voyage to its wintering grounds in Central and South America. And this, again, is a bird that um, will spend the winter as far south as Peru. So um, as a threatened species, we have different studies that have been made of threats to Canada warbler on its breeding grounds and threats to Canada warbler on its wintering grounds, but um, I haven't yet, and that doesn't mean there aren't any, but I haven't yet found uh, a study of the stopover areas of the habitat the, that the Canada Warbler uses on its voyage from Nova Scotia to South America. So this is one of the gaps that we're trying to fill in in this study, um, because certainly, uh, stopover habitat <clears throat> um, is important for these birds to make that voyage and have sufficient foods to refuel all, along the way. So, okay, I'm stopping there. Thanks so much, John. Thanks everybody for, um, for those really interesting conversations about um, coastal island conservation. And I feel like we got a really good picture as to why it's, it's so crucial. Um, just wondering if we have any questions from folks um, out there. So I've got a couple here um, on our Q&A section. So for anyone listening, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, log on to that Q&A uh, function on your toolbar at the bottom and um, ask your questions. So um, Mel, I know Nick had kind of answered a little bit of this earlier, but she's wondering if there's uh, populations of the shorebirds on the southwest coast um, are they affected by the proliferation of birds of prey, like bald eagles, um, and the proliferation of uh, predators like otters and minks? Uh, who's that directed to? Anyone, um, anyone really. Um, well, yes. Um, if, you, if you went to like Evangeline Beach today, um, at the guzzle, you would see, um, you likely see peregrine falcons uh, uh, um, attacking um, semi uh, the large flocks of semi palmated sandpipers. So, um, predator predators are a risk for migratory birds, for sure. 
um, when they're in um, when they're in these stopover areas. Um, if you went to Briar Island, um, you can often often see um, sharp-shinned hawks chasing flickers, and you hear the flickers crying, so uh, screaming. Uh, not even when they're caught, they just can scream even just when they see one of these birds approaching it. Um, <clears throat> So um, predation is definitely a problem. And this is one of the reasons that birds might decide to make an over water voyage is because there's likely to be less predation uh, over water than there would be um, when they're um, on land. Was there a second part of that question? I'm sorry. Oh, just, um, we were just wondering if like the proliferation of predators like otters and minks, um, as well as those birds of prey. And I, I do think that primarily that would be, you know, more so on the mainland than on some of these more remote um, offshore islands. But I do know that there is uh, some significant um, predation on some of these coastal islands by other species. Which kind of takes us into the, another question that was asked by Sarah Long. And Sarah's wondering if there's a risk of other predators arriving on the islands, for example, rats, uh, which would pose a greater threat to leeches storm petrol. So I think that would be a great one. Riel, I know you answered it in the, um, uh, in the chat, but I would one, wondered if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit more to the group about that. Yeah, so um, I mentioned in the chat that um, Seal Island, it's uh, quite a bit farther out than Bon Portage, but they apparently used to have a lot of petrels out there. We don't know what the numbers were. It was before people really studied them, um, but they don't nest there anymore in any great numbers because rats and squirrels and such have arrived on the island. But they're very easy prey for any land-based predators because they live in the ground. Um, and I also mentioned in the question, in my answer to the question, um, otters and mink also sometimes appear on these islands. Um, and they just wreak havoc. They just, they eat them, they cache them, they rip their heads off, they just, they make a mess. Um, sometimes they leave, sometimes they don't. Um, and sometimes we have to trap them and other times remove them <laughs> by force. Anyway, uh, yes, they can be very devastating when they arrive on these islands. So it's really important we protect these areas and keep uh, land-based predators in particular off of them. Great, thanks, Riel. Um, Bob Gansel's wondering about hummingbird migration. I feel like, John, that might be a good question for you. Um, hummingbirds, um, yes. Um, they, uh, uh, we don't know, I, I don't know um, exactly if they crossed um, the Bay of Fundy or the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we do know that they crossed the Gulf of Mexico. So they, they will cross large bodies of water. How large is the Gulf of Mexico compared to the Gulf of Maine? Do you know? Um, Would those be well, comparable distances or? Well, in some cases, yes, it depends. They, sometimes they'll, uh, sometimes it depends where they leave. When you're talking about the Gulf of Mexico, sometimes they're leaving from Florida. Sometimes they're leaving from um, Mississippi, Alabama. In other cases, they're losing, they're leaving from Louisiana, Texas, and they're, and, and they're just going a, a shorter trip uh, across to Mexico, or in other cases, they may be making a longer trip um, directly to uh, like Venezuela. Great, thanks, John. Or, um, so another question came in from Michael Giroir, who's wondering, um, are any of the audio monitoring equipment devices available for purchase online for citizen science, um, or are they primarily just available through organizations? Um, <clears throat> Well, the um, the uh, the wildlife acoustics, the the the, the more um, established commercial software like um, the song meter, that's the two on the left in my on that slide. They're available through the uh, a company in Massachusetts called Wildlife Acoustics. Um, the 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 bucket microphone in there that's available through um, a, 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 a a company named Old Bird, um, and then the Audio Moth um, is not technically a commercial product. It's produced by a, a lab, um, <clears throat> so there's no kind of like guarantee or anything on it. 
but you can order them through um, two sources. One is called Lab Maker, and the other one is called Group, group Gets. Um, group Gets is a crowdsourcing, um, I guess would be the name for it, type of uh, purchasing. Um, but I've ordered through there, they're very reliable, and you can get, um, uh, you can get audio moths at um, 50, Fifty dollars U.S. there, whereas for if you bought it through Lab Maker, it might be around seventy-five dollars a piece. Great, I'm just checking. We've got one via the chat, I believe. Really, I, I think I just posted. I was just in so far as minks go, and um, and it also you know gives me another chance to highlight the type of amazing data Ted collects on his website. But in 2009, there were some minks that made it onto um, North Brother and um, were you know, quite devastating um, for the turns. And it also, you know, just as a variable, you know, for looking at all those different islands and like factors that maybe would be important for birds and not, certainly it's something that we've thought about, you know, measuring the distance to shore. Just because obviously an island like Gull Island that's so secluded you know, there's very little risk, but North Brother, like we could even have a picture from shore. It's only about 500 meters away. So it's like an island that's very important for turns, but at the same time, kind of very high risk for a mammalian predator to make it over there. So that's a bit of context. Great, thanks a lot, Nick. Um, and just kind of one last uh, slide here to just, if you do have any other questions from today's um, presentation from our panel discussion, um, here's just some contact information where you can reach everyone. Um, you're welcome to contact me um, if you're interested in, in volunteering uh, with the Nature Trust, for instance. Um, we do have a birding program uh, called Bird's Eye View, um, where basically just it's birders doing what they love and submitting uh, their eBird lists uh, from Nature Trust properties um, on eBird and just sharing those lists with us um, to kind of help give us a sense of which birds are using our, our properties. And um, just, you know, if there are potential stewardship issues that we need to address in order to um, help those populations. So I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, thanks everyone so much for joining us today. Um, we're finishing right on time, um, so that's wonderful. And just another big thank you to all of our panelists, Riel, Nick, John, and Jessica. Thank you all for uh, your contributions today. It was a really interesting discussion. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.